Hey there, my name is Mark McCartney and welcome to the What is a Good Life podcast. Over the last three years, I've interviewed over 200 people around this question, not to prescribe you with the universal answer, but to help you to find and define your own answer to this question. I'm hoping the guests' curiosities, lines of inquiries, and musings and experiences will prompt your own inquiry into what this question means to you. Well, I'm also trying to share with you what I perceive to be more genuine expressions of the human experience and indeed more meaningful conversations. Which brings us to this week and the 70th episode of the What is a Good Life podcast. I'm delighted to introduce Holly Penalver as our guest. Holly is the founder of Indigo Volunteers, a remarkable charity that has made a significant impact on the lives of tens of thousands of refugees. By placing thousands of volunteers with grassroots partners, Indigo provides essential aid, healthcare, education, skills workshops, and vital services to refugees along the European migratory route. Having spent years in the field, working hands-on in places like Greece, Serbia and Bosnia, she now works for the disaster relief charity Shelterbox as their volunteer development manager. In this episode, Holly takes us on her journey of caring for community, inspired by the support that she felt at home to setting up Indigo Volunteers. She talks about the significance of both being willing to accept and give help, the importance of forgiving ourselves, letting go of right and wrong, the significance of realizing multiple things can be true at the same time, and how we are not as important as we think, which can all help release us to doing more good in the world. Throughout this conversation, it is clear that Holly is someone who will take action if she notices something that ought to be done and someone isn't doing it. Whether it's an aspect of our own communities or indeed our own personal lives, where we notice an absence of required action. There's so much inspiration to draw from Holly's energy, and the perspective shared in this episode. Look, I took so much from this episode and including so many interpersonal nuances and subtleties that relate as much to our own interpersonal relationships as they do the the wider community and the help and the support that we can potentially offer there as well. So I'm sure you're going to take a lot from this episode as well. And if you enjoy this conversation, please like, share and subscribe. And if you're on the podcasting platforms, please continue to leave your lovely reviews as I greatly appreciate your support at this stage of my podcasting journey. And you can check out the show notes below to to find out more about Indigo Volunteers and potential ways for you to get involved. And indeed, ways of contacting me, whether it's for individual coaching, executive group coaching, or silent retreats that I'll be running later this year as well. And please check out www.whatisagood.life for the podcast newsletter if you'd like to hear more of my reflections and thoughts on the conversations that you're listening to. So that's all for me for this week, and I look forward to carrying on the conversation with you next week. And so without further ado, the 70th episode of the What is a Good Life podcast. Holly, thank you so much for joining me today on the What is a Good Life podcast. Uh, After checking out the work that you do and feeling somewhat insecure about my own contributions to society, (laughs) uh, I'm very grateful to have you here, and I've been very much looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, me too. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it, and thank you for having me. Cheers, Holly. So the the first question as I start these off with is, is there a question you're trying to answer as you move through life? Yeah, um, probably lots and none, if that makes any sense. I I think um, for me, with the big questions around what's the meaning of life, is there a God and what's thinking about death, I honestly kind of let them flow through me if that makes any sense like yeah I don't th- I don't think about them too much because I like to I'm just happy how things are and and, and my thoughts on it and just uh, yeah I just try and live in the moment in the present but something a question that often crops up for me is around community and what are we doing that works well as community uh, to, to make community work nowadays, but also what's going wrong? What's going so wrong where we're lacking community and the impact that's having on absolutely everyone alive today? And I think about it all the time. And I did. I think until um, we started our interaction, I didn't realise how often I thought about it. Um, and I can just see this popping up in my mind everywhere. I walk into town, that question comes up because I'll see something like, oh, that person needs help. Why is no one else going over to help them? Or my work with Indigo is all around community, right? Like uh, helping people that have arrived on the shores of Europe so they're not 
completely lost and just having someone there that can help either with food or shelter or legal support or whatever it is that is essentially all of, all about community so I, I and I started in to go with that in mind thinking why are we not helping each other more so I, I think that's the thing that crops up very frequently like multiple times a day and it's centered around when people need support and, and and when I see them not getting it I'm like okay but why why is that not in place can you tell me at what point this question became more pressing in your mind or or even when it stirred you to action like what what's your kind of evolution with that mm. uh, that question around community yeah that's that's a, that is a good question i think i think okay so it probably started brewing when I was uh, around 11 or 12 um, we started fostering children as a family and I remember not understanding why children had to go into foster care and what is it I I understood okay the maybe the mother was using drugs and they couldn't look after the child or the and the father was absent or whatever the, the stories might be or the background of that child but then I thought but what about the grandparents the aunties uncles the friends the godparents whatever might be in place why how have they ended up in a completely strange home so I think the, the question started then and because I have such a supportive uh, mum um, auntie, um, siblings. I I didn't uh, because that's all I'd experienced to that point. I didn't know that other children didn't have that in in place as well. So that that was a really big life lesson around. Okay, so I've got my family support network and community, as it were. And yes, yeah, so I I think that's when it started. Was okay, but how have they ended up in in our home and and not somewhere where they where they're more familiar with and would obviously be better for them? But that's because it didn't exist for them. Um, and it started making me think about families and how, um, as I grew a bit older, and especially since becoming a mum myself and seeing my friends become parents, how normalised it is to not have support, to to do it kind of you and maybe you and your partner. And but obviously being um, uh, having a lot of female friends, a, a lot of childcare going on on the mum's shoulders and just again thinking but why is this normalized why and and I made such a point of it when um I had my son almost three years ago that I didn't want that for him I wanted his extended family to feel really close with him if I could make it work it was a bit of an experiment I had no idea you know if it would if it would work so um from the day he was born actually he was born at home in the morning and then in the afternoon all four grandparents were around uh and and holding him and I was like this is exactly the path I want to go down and it's carried on like that since so he's been always so close with his grandparents he sees them every single week and feels really comfortable around them and it means for me as a support and community that I have that if I if I just need a breather or I need to do something on Saturday I can say hey is it possible you can have him for a few hours and it's not a weird uh, concept, and, and I say this because not everyone has this luxury, right? Not everyone has grandparents nearby. Not everyone has the luxury of being close to their family. I fully understand that. Like I also have some difficult fi- family dynamics as well. However, I think what the point I'm trying to make is around ex- accept being willing to accept help, but also being willing to give the help, and that is what's making the whole community thing work. And I think why it's breaking down. One of the reasons is we are really going down the direction of being less and less willing to accept help because we want to be able to say we've done it ourselves and and I I, re- I don't think that's a good thing necessarily yeah that that um sense of like almost like a badge of honor yeah of not needing help or I I interviewed someone recently where they said um you know, almost this idea of resilience is something that we we value, but really what we need is the group or the community to hold us in those periods of time and just say it's going to be okay. Yeah. There, there is something really peculiar about just what I'm seeing contributes to people's experience of, you know, feeling connected, feeling connected mm-hmm. to themselves. And it seems almost at complete odds with what we're valuing as a, as a society in particular, in particular segments of society anyway. 
yeah, the resilience is a really great word for that, actually. Um, and where, and again, in certain situations, it's, it is a really positive thing, but I think it's overused and, and maybe put into the wrong contexts and places where we're actually receiving help is the strongest thing you can do. It's, it's actually the best thing you can do. And it shows strength that you do that. And I, I think that it's just seen as often as, as weakness. I mean, for me, setting up Indigo, I accept any time someone offered help, I was like, yes, yep, yep, please help me. Because, and that's why it's here today. Because I think if I'd been someone that's like, no, I'm going to do this myself. And I want to take the credit. And I want to show that I can do this or whatever the reasons are behind doing it yourself. I don't want to seem weak or incapable. If I'd done that, I don't think Indigo would exist, honestly, because there's no way I could have done it without the help of so many pe dozens of people, whether it was even a tiny bit at an event or for m multiple months or years. Like, people have contributed significantly to getting the charity to where it is today. And that's because, honestly, I think I, I've accepted help. And a lot of that comes from the comfort within you, like feeling comfortable and confident in yourself that yeah I've I know I've I've got some strengths I know I've got some weaknesses and where the weaknesses are I'm going to try and uh, utilize the support of my network for for that yeah and and I think particularly you know in western culture this is just broken down so much and um and I, I, I just think it's really un unhealthy and and seeing your family friends and colleagues as a support system and utilizing it I mean how much can you imagine how much better and easier things would be if we really both received and gave in the way that would just help each other and, and our lives um so I'm, I'm trying to live that I'm, I definitely <laughs> have definitely majorly uh, failing sometimes with it but I think um <laughs> on the whole I, I really am living and breathing that way and um and I feel honestly really content and joyous and and happy um and, and a lot of it is down to that I think what just out, out of interest what I know you mentioned a supportive family at the start but this sense of feeling uh comfortable in in asking or accepting uh help what what if you were to reflect on that like what do you think contributed to that uh, mm. eventuality um i think prob first thing that comes to mind is is uh confidence in myself and self-worth i think if you don't feel worthy perhaps you feel like you've got something to prove and you've got to show that you can do x y or z and if you feel yeah, like just like I said about acknowledging like, yeah, I'm, I'm really good at this, but I'm really not good at this. And this is where I need help. And the, my self-worth, um, I think, uh, largely came from my mum, just in a really casual way. I, just, I don't think she made any deal out of it. But just like, yeah, you can, you can, you're a smart cookie. You can go on to do what you what you want and giving me that s slow self-confidence. Like just, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it was subtle, but I wouldn't say it was in your face. It was just slowly... Uh, with all her children, so I've, got, I've got two uh, other siblings as well, um, with my from my mum, and uh, she she also made a point that around grades, uh, she she was always like, as long as you're happy, I think maybe happy is a strong word now, maybe content is a better word, but she at the time was using happy. If you're happy, I don't care about your grades. I don't, um, you know, if you're trying, obviously again around intentions. If you're trying and you know you're you're getting a a d in something that's fine whereas i know a lot of people whose parents were like really telling them off if this was the case and criticizing and and i think my mom took a really holistic approach like it's not just about grades it's about who you are and being kind and and helping other people and that's you know taking that holistic approach on a child and so then i wasn't having a nagging voice in my head every day which a lot of people experience i know from conversations with with my adult friends you know that that they um they've grown up with this and I see also behaviors around parents towards children around how it's how parents communicate with children the way in which they're being told off or the the feedback they're given or don't do that it's annoying rather than maybe you can say the same feedback in a slightly different way and it's completely turns the whole thing around so for example you know around 
attention seeking if you change the word to connection seeking like how big a difference does that make for the child and for you they're not attention they are trying to get your attention but they're trying to get your connection and the whole just that simple language change makes a really big difference so um I see this happening as well to to children I think gosh what are they if they're getting that 10 times a day um how's that going to make them feel as adults probably how a lot of adults are feeling now which is to be honest quite crap about themselves you know so much self-doubt so much imposter syndrome so much anxiety, depression, this it, it's rife. And I and I think a lot of this comes from yeah, not obviously not just from parents, although that's a big, big part of it. Like, but and again, it's not even just individual parents, it's how we perceive what is good, what is success for our child. This uh, man, this sense of what if we thought about this as connection seeking rather than attention seeking. Um you know, I'm, I have an eight-month-old now at this stage, and I've broken parenting down to if I'm present, if she gets my attention, and that's like, you know, a heavy leaning on lack of technology around yeah. when I'm with her. Um, then if I'm just me, then I'll be fine as a father if I can just allow her be her. Yeah. And just what you're saying there, the significance of your mother saying whatever grades, like I I put a I put greater importance on how you're feeling like that sounds yeah. like just and I, I understand why you're creating the the contrast between that and, and what so many people experience because that does sound almost like almost like counterculture or something do you, do you know what I mean like it sounds almost yeah. like radical but it's so how would that be yeah, it, it, it's like it, it's. I, I'd like you to be happy. How is that radical in the slightest? Yeah. Like, yeah. Which, which is bonkers. Yeah, and and there's so much around it as well. Like a, a lot of uh, again. Um, so I can verbalise this a bit better now because I've recently been reading the Alain de Botton uh, School of Life. I don't know if you've come across it, but he's absolutely brilliant, and he um, talks about. Um, are you? He said. He said lots of lots of people say. Oh. Um, I'm not doing a good job parenting. And we you know we have a lot of parent guilt. We have a lot of oh, am I doing a, am I doing this right? And he said that he came across a doctor that said he came across so many parents coming in worried. And then the doctor said, listen, it's not if, about if you're a great parent. The question is, are you a good enough parent? Yeah, yeah. And I do you know what? That 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 flipped everything for me. Thank God I I listened to this at the beginning after just having a baby, because you know I so, I sometimes made mistakes. Like honestly, some sometimes it would get to dinner and I'd forget. Like oh my God, I've got a child and I've got to give him because I wasn't used to. He was breastfeeding and I wasn't used to thinking of dinner for him. And I'd just forget and I'd like oh my God, I've forgotten my own son's dinner. Oh. And I'd go, hang on, am I good enough? Is he starving? No. Am I giving him love? Yeah. Is he safe? Yeah. I'm good enough. And then it just changed everything for me. Like I and and every time I I I screw something up with him, I, obviously nothing major. I'm like, am I good enough? Yeah. Okay, I can forgive myself for that. And I think the forgiving of my and maybe my partner might argue I forgive myself too easily sometimes with life. <laughs> like, maybe I'll do something. I'm like, well, I tried. <laughs> oh well, I'll forgive myself. <laughs> Um, but I do think it's the way forward, honestly, because what's the point of berating yourself and criticizing yourself for three hours or three days about something? I mean, sometimes I'll slip up and say something wrong or whatever. We all do the make these mistakes throughout our days and weeks and months. But generally speaking, what I do is just say, am I human? Am I going to make mistakes? Yeah. Have I made a mistake? Yeah. Is there something I can do to rectify it? Apologize or okay. Yes or no. Answer that question and, and action or not. Okay. Move on. Because what's the, what good is it for me to, as I say, spend all this time thinking about it and criticizing myself. I'm a human. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to make hundreds more, learn from it, forgive myself, move on. And I, and but also with others and I'm very forgiving with other people and again maybe too forgiving with other people and that can be sometimes a bit bad but I just think what was their intention did they meet did they wake up that morning thinking I'm gonna do something to upset Holly today no is the answer I always conclude the answer is no um so that 
this has just happened and I forgive them immediately. Like, okay, let's move on. So I think that's a, a, a nice way, a, a more relaxed way of living at least. And it can maybe take some practice if you're not used to it. But I do think it's it's helpful if we're just forgiving each other more and not holding grudges. Oh my God, the amount of time wasted on on grudges that are, are actually quite pedantic in the grand scheme of life. Uh, this resonates 100% with my experience. And I, th I think it's even interesting the the framing of it. Do I forgive people too easily? But to me, it doesn't sound like that at all. I, I think it's just the standards uh, that society has set make make it normal to be just like almost vengeful or yeah. to stew on something for months and almost hold on to like, I think one of the most damaging things for relationships, and maybe even we could extend that out for the sake of community too, mm -hmm. is the holding on, like the really holding on for dear life to the concept of right or wrong. And, oh my god you, you know and when you because with a certain amount of self-reflection or self-awareness right like it becomes painfully obvious that while I think I'm trying to live a reflective life a contemplative life and I take accountability and I know my patterns and all this I make so many mistakes and yeah. like and and that's fine like it, it really you know it really, as long as my intention is whatever it may be, and I, I feel like I'm, I'm not, I'm not abdicating yeah. responsibility, and I'm being accountable. Just like you said, if I've done something that I think needs apologizing for or acknowledging, acknowledge mm. it. But mm. it's interesting for me to reflect on my life and go, man, I'm, I'm clearly trying, um, and I'm clearly thinking about this stuff, and yet I can still do X, Y, or Z. So yeah. what's it like for somebody else who doesn't have the time that I've had uh, or the privilege I've had of had the time to reflect in my life? And and very much, which is like what you said, I think this is so important to reflect on for people. Did that person wake up with the intention of getting, of upsetting me? Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm not that important in anyone's life for that exactly. to have been their intention, you know? Exactly. And that's a key thing you've just said. I'm not that important. And I think that it, we all need a dose of this every day to realise our insignificance and like, oh, is that person thinking about what I said? Hmm, maybe, maybe 10% of what you think they are, but also probably not because they've got their own things going on. They've got their own lives. And honestly, you probably in many situations not that important to be for them to be thinking about this thing that you've done or said you know a hundred percent and and I think just feeling okay I know this is a bit um some people don't find this comfortable but I but some people really love hearing this um I take great comfort in knowing that in a hundred years time everyone I know will be gone and no one will remember me and or very unlikely anyone will remember me and and that may, and I look up at the stars and I think how many hundreds of thousands millions and millions and millions of people have come before me I don't know any of them and I, that just great brings me great comfort a hundred years so if I'm having a bad hair day literally a bad hair day and I'm like oh god stupid hair I'm like, oh my God, is anyone going to go? Oh, on the 23rd of June, Holly had a bad hair day in 1998. No, no one cares. So then I can move on from it immediately. And it just really helps me. And I know that some people don't like it because they want to feel more significant and important. And I get it. At the same time, it is so releasing to know that nothing really matters. And I mean that in a positive way. So if nothing matters, why not do good? Why not? help each other why not be kinder why not um do what we can while we're on this earth and then we're gone you know this uh i i take immense comfort from this uh and it's something that i think if people were to contemplate is really liberating like so for example i don't know what my great grandparents did like i have maybe i could ch uh, follow up my family tree a bit more but i literally i don't even know what their names are um yeah. and so like I've had this thought, like who is going to remember? Even if you're like, even if you were famous by today's standards, yeah, it's very likely like that. I don't like you won't know who was famous a hundred years from uh, from now. Exactly. And so I think it's it's so I think that's so liberating, and and it is that thing. Like it it is. I do view that as well as a release to just go. Well, then you may as well just do things that actually make you feel good and make other people feel good. And and then yeah. I think that even just the holistic view of looking up at the stars too, and I forget how many 
you know, thousand trillion stars there are in the galaxy or the the universe. Um, yeah. But it is that thing again of like, wow, like, or 110 billion humans have apparently lived and walked on this planet and, and we're all going to die. Like, yeah. y- you know, like, it, 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 so mm. there's mm. the stuff that we're holding on to. And yeah. I, I, just, I do enjoy a good hair day. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's, and, it's and, a wonderful and, feeling. So I'm not looking to diminish that. But, yeah. you know, the, the trivial stuff that we're holding on to really, it doesn't. It's so insignificant. It, it's so insignificant. And so sometimes I think, like, yeah, did that person mean to um, do something that would upset me? No. Okay. And am I going to care about this even tomorrow or in a week? No. So try and let it go now. Um, and also something interesting that you said around like the black and white, right and wrong. That's also something that's like really interesting to delve into because I feel like with so much going on in the world, like, you know, Israel, Palestine, with all the um, division in America, like you could, you, there's a hundred examples like this, whether it's just like us versus them or thousands of examples like it. Um, what I, th- I'm really struggle to to see people not do is that people don't seem to understand that that multiple things can be true at the same time and and i'm just like why is that so hard why is that a hard concept why is it a hard concept to think i'm on this side and you're on this side but actually we both can agree on these two things we can agree that that's wrong and that's wrong or that's right and that's right we don't have to be everything that this side does is right and everything your side does is wrong and that's unfortunately how not even how it's framed although the framing and kind of you know uh do want to say sometimes propaganda or campaigns or messages and stuff they they obviously perpetuate this but i mean i'm seeing it on videos of watching people talk about the other side and the other side always being wrong and, and that person's side always being right and i just think that's actually just really not an intelligent thing to say and it's really um lacking in all the nuances that are required for us to be be connecting and getting on and it's again it's around that connection of there is so there is more that connects us absolutely than divides us you know it's like 98 99 of things connect us we all we all want to be safe and have food and all the basics we all want as humans basically and there's only that 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 little bit left that it really divides us I think and being aware that that multiple things can be true at the same time and therefore the other's side can be right and you can be right about something would would get us so far like we, we would just come such a long way I think if we could hold that and feel that when you mentioned at the start this idea of like okay you look at community and there's this question continuously around community you're exploring what works well and and kind of what's going wrong is that one of the elements that you're looking at like when you're thinking of what's going wrong because to me that sounds um like the things that i'm fascinated with is just the relationships the spaces between us the interdependencies the connection Mm. and when i think of like every, any relationship like if we bring it down to the micro if there's a part of a relationship where one person only sees it as from their perspective and everything outside of that is is not helpful that it's going to be a difficult time with that person yeah. and then if so on the macro like if we think even if people are mm-hmm. are gathering in groups or tribes to play that out on a on a bigger scale that just seems like such a detriment to yeah. feeling a part of a community, a wider community around the things that matter way more than even like your political view. Like there's so many things like that are that are so fundamentally shared experience. I mean, being a human that yeah. like that, like the fixation of these things seems to be a real detriment to how we could possibly merge more, being more in commune than than in yeah. than in. Uh, them with a with a different perspective yeah yeah and uh, yeah I think it it does it completely plays into this whole idea of community and and yeah perhaps like the 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 us versus them and I'm I'm just thinking when you're speaking around um with with Indigo the charity and 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 people who are open-minded are going out to help people they don't even know they've never met they're complete strangers even though they've been portrayed as you know, invaders or whatever and trying to take all our... All the messages that we are receiving and yet these people are still kind of like, I'm not believing that or kind of want to see this for myself and they're going out to help. But unfortunately, there's still all the 
people that just get those messages and then they they believe it and they hold on to it like their tr- it's their truth and they can't that can't be shaken you were talking also about perceptions and what people perceive um so I, I can give an example. Um, my partner has been saying, I really just want a quiet morning one weekend. We're always busy doing stuff. And I was like, okay, great. So I planned, okay, we'll go to, um, his father plays organ at a church. We'll just do a little family morning. We'll go to the church, listen to his father play the organ and then come home. I was over the moon that I'd come up with this wonderful quiet plan. And he was like, that wasn't a quiet morning. We were still with people. We were still getting up busy going and da da And I was like, oh my God, our perceptions are completely different of what a quiet morning is. So I could say, hey, what are you talking about? Of course we had a quiet morning. And he can be like, no, we didn't. And we both are right because we both feel that morning differently. Um, yeah. That's just using a really simple example. But it, yeah, this, this is completely, um, people can feel differently. And, that, and that's the thing we struggle with, that their their experience is different to ours and therefore they can form a different opin- um, opinion from it, basically. So when you mentioned this idea of, you know, this quiet morning with your husband and it, and it meaning one thing to you, like it, it brings up this poem uh, by Rumi in my head, like there's a, it's called the elephant, uh, the elephant in the, in the dark or something like that, where you get five people that have never seen an elephant go into a room and you ask them what an elephant is and someone touches its legs and they say an elephant is like the pillars on a column, like someone touches its trunk, an elephant is like a, a water fountain. And without the awareness of what everyone else has seen. And and I think there's so much of life that if we just appreciate that we're just holding one perspective or one vantage point on the same thing, but there are other vantage points. I don't know, for me, that that's a fundamentally important part of healthy relating or a healthy community. Mm, yeah, that is such a beautiful poem to use as an example. Um, and of course, it comes into all aspects but particularly like if you've got a, a a partner and the arguments you can have in a relationship and um I think we're all guilty well hopefully we're all guilty it's not just me but I think we're all guilty it's of, just you <laughs> it's just me I'm a witch <laughs> um no uh, I think um we're all guilty of not giving that grace to our partner that like we might do to someone else I mean and I've had this conversation recently um I think that I'm kinder to strangers than I am to my own family is, but which is really why is that and that's a lot of therapy sessions I've got to get through to kind of I suppose work out that answer I don't know why <laughs> um I just feel like I think it's partly because I just feel like my family are okay I know I know they're okay and like the stranger I don't know I don't know what's going on in their lives and how uh, how hard things must be for them. Normally, it's you know, maybe it's a homeless person or something. I'm like God. Um, so I I'm more patient, understanding, tolerant, kind, and then I can r- not be like that. You know, with with my partner, for example, and and so. But luckily, we can talk about it and 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 call each other out if that is happening. Uh, but it is it is hard, isn't it? But yeah, that whole just thinking from the other person's perspective. Um, uh, and really listening, like really listen, you know, like not just not listen to respond, you know, listen to hear. There's that whole saying, isn't there, around yeah. that, and, and and that makes such a difference. Because even the um, like, there's so much subtlety going on um, with our communication, and it's not even just a like, what words did you say, and what was your body language, like. You know, sometimes even when you just, you know, before your friends even told you that they're experiencing tension as a couple and nobody had to tell you that they were experiencing tension. It, it was just, yeah. um, you know. it's completely felt. And so I think we're in a lot of times, you know, we're almost playing lawyers with our own behavior, like defending things like, well, what did I say? Yeah. Well, what was, what was the expression on my face? And yeah. while I think that can be, going back to even multiple examples of or things you've said of, well, this is the way society behaves, even if it was just saying, am I forgiving too much? Or <laughs> no, maybe society is holding on to things too 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 long, yeah. if you know what I mean. I think that's yeah. another aspect of our, our relating or communicating, which is just makes us suffer so much because we deny the fact that what we, either our intention or we deny the energy we brought to a situation, even though someone felt it so clearly, and we just we yeah. get hung up on well, what did I say? What did I actually? What did I? What did my yeah, body? Yeah, that's do? really good. 
Yeah, exactly. And a really great point because, um, and, and me and my partner go to relationship therapy, so we've learned this, that the whole, and it's maybe a bit cliche, but it works, saying it feels like da-da-da. So rather than saying, well, you were mad at me. I'm like, oh, I wasn't. And you just go, yes, you were. No, I wasn't. You know, that's no good to anyone. Yeah. But if you say it feels like you were mad at me, you can't argue that. The other person can't argue that because they're telling you how it feels for them. And then automatically, rather than, for example, if it was me going, no, I wasn't mad, I can go, oh, God, I'm sorry that that it made you feel that way. Or I, that's not what I meant. That's not how I meant to come across. So that's not how I felt. So whether it's me doing it, uh, p- coming across wrong or you perceiving it wrong, that's another debate. But like, that's not what was meant. And you can immediately, s- the, the defensiveness can just fizzle away um, by saying it's how I feel. And that's just a top tip uh, if anyone's <laughs> listening that, <laughs> that needs that in their relationship. Oh, it's great. So it's, it's a real um, cork of that one. Yeah, yeah. It's just going back to your the your opening idea again of like what's working in society or not um the sense of then what other elements of society do you see or community that are working where uh, that are that aren't working um and then what comes from mind for you as well then when you're thinking of what do you see that's actually working well almost like what gives you hope mm-hmm. as well mm. oh yeah um so I think when we, and I, I'm absolutely guilty of this, so I have to really switch myself out of it sometimes. When we leave the house, for example, to go and run some errands, we're thinking of ourselves and what we need and what we're about to do. And actually, during our errands, we may come across someone that needs help, and it can be directions, it can be food, it can be anything. And to be aware and to give that space to uh, to to let our minds rather than just like I, can't, I don't have time for this because that's mostly the reason why I think a lot of people don't stop I don't have time or whatever to think ah this is my little section that I maybe allocated to check that someone's okay and also being proactive with it if someone's not looking good or looking lost I'll give you an example um on New Year's Eve <clears throat> um there was a, a teenage boy uh, at the train station I was walking through, uh, crying, sitting in the corner crying. And everyone was walking past and I just clocked him. I thought, I just looked at him for like five, ten seconds. He didn't see me. Like, okay, is anyone going to stop? Okay, well then, if I'm one of those people that's not stopping, so I should obviously go and check in on him. And maybe he's fine. What's the worst thing that can happen? He just says, go away, I don't need help. Okay, that's the worst thing that can happen. And I went over there and... Um, it turns out, long story short, that he um, was uh, uh, autistic. He had gone there to train spot. His train was cancelled and he didn't know what to do because it was a change and he really struggled. Well, he didn't articulate all this to me. I figured obviously a lot of this out, but he his train was cancelled. He did not know what to do and he couldn't work out how to get home and he wasn't prepared for this change in his plan. And he, the, the strange thing was he was crying opposite the doors of the ticket office and information desk and he didn't know to just walk in there so I said hey don't worry I'm sure that we can resolve this I'm sure there's going to be another train up, uh, soon let's go in together and we went in together and we, we resolved it and then um, I made sure he got on his train and and everything was was fine but he and I just thought gosh this I don't know how many hundreds of people walked past him before someone stopped or how long he was crying for um, and I just think it's about um, being aware, just also looking around, being aware. People might not even ask you for help, but actually going over to someone saying, hey, are you okay? People are looking lost on the underground and they're looking at a map for ages. Just like, hey, I know the underground. Can I help you get somewhere? Oh, this is the, the, the best route. Like just these little things. And um, so I think part of it is being proactive and being aware that it might happen and you might be approached even, or that doesn't happen too often where you're, where you're approached, I don't think. Um, and it works well to be open-minded and responsive and also saying no with kindness. You don't have to be like, no, get on. Just like, hey, I'm sorry, I can't help you today. You can do it kindly, you know. Um, where it's working well is when there's there's groups, there's, there are communities out there. Like, And I think also, again, being a little bit proactive to find them. Uh, and if there's not, why not start one, you know? Um, that's what happened with Indigo. I was like, okay, this this 
there should be a community here existing and it's it's not I, ca I can't find one after lots of research okay I'm going to start it I didn't realize it's going to end up into a charity that's running you know over a decade later I had no idea but there's there are so many local groups community centers rotary clubs um all kinds of of things out there if you do want to utilize them and and I just think that connection with people is something that just it, it you, you rarely leave feeling worse about yourself you know like when you uh when you join together with as a group like I've just recently joined a choir and I just leave like I'm walking on a cloud or something like yeah. it's just so nice to sing together as a group of humans that don't know each other so um yeah you know it's um you said it's uh, just little things, you know, even helping someone on the underground, but given where we put some of our other time, uh, like, and what we get back, like, let's say if it was social media and how kind of crap people can, can intrinsically feel after engaging that for a long yeah. time, like, it really is a large thing, though, as well, isn't it? Like, I, I think, yeah. it, you know, it, it leaves people with a sense of, like, ah, I'm connected to people. I think that it's a quote by... Um, I think it, it's a quote by Emerson that says to help one life breathe easier is, is to have success or something to that effect. It's beautiful. And, and, and I really like, I think we profoundly feel that when, when we have experiences like that, when you're talking about that, it makes me think of even like I have a local coffee shop where I say hello to absolutely everyone. And I could just go in there for a coffee in the morning and probably say hello, good morning to maybe eight or nine people just who happen to be there uh, that I kind of yeah. have some familiarity with now. But just even as I'm queuing up, I could hear about how, I don't know, how um, how someone is struggling being a parent or how someone's stressed about a project, uh, how someone's really excited about some creative endeavor they're on. And it's just like all mm -hmm. these little moments of interaction. And I just leave after just being in there for 15 minutes while waiting for my coffee almost and just having a, a little bit of small talk. And I almost feel like yeah. I'm leaving on, on cloud nine. Like it, it's... I, I don't know what it will take for us to genuinely appreciate that these, you know, things that we could think of as little things are so substantial to how we to we, how we yeah. feel in this world. Mm. And um, also, people feel so alone in their feelings. They feel so alone that they're the only bad parent. They're the only one struggling creatively. Yeah. They're the only one having this business problem, and they're not. Like we're all having these same things, and just talking about it. Obviously, the the relief and release that you can feel with it. Um, it's so therapeutic to know that you're you're not alone, and you can lean on each other for this support. Um, yeah, and and that phone thing is a really big one. Like because we're on our phones, we're not having these small interactions, and that is what's also like a ruining the ability to do this successfully. I, I'd completely agree, and even in terms of noticing, even when we were talking about noticing the subtlety in a in a partner or a friend, like so much is we're being like this is being transmitted, even if not in words, and we we potentially are missing that as well. Just really curious as to you know you mentioned earlier as 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 young as 11 or 12 even your family um fostering children uh this sense of you know knowing your own self-worth your own self-awareness um like your mother promoting a sense of contentment over like potential external achievement and and focusing on attention and and your kind of your journey from you know seen the significance of that as a as a child um to then even setting up indigo like what what was the what was some of your path or what were some of the significant uh i don't know moments that that contributed to that being an eventuality yeah i think i i, I um whenever i saw a, a, a disaster happen around the world you know a tsunami and earthquake and like most people just feel helpless and like, I want to help. I want to help. What can I do? I remember those feelings so strongly and finding it really hard to let them go. Um, so that was a really uh, important thing for me to notice how that impacted me and how many other people felt the same. So I kept that in my mind, boxed it. And then when I finished, um, I studied psychology uh, to start with and wanting to volunteer and help and not being able to do that without paying, you know, a, a, a large fee to a, a company that was for profit. And I thought this is just doesn't seem right. So I ended up not volunteering and traveled and through traveling and meeting people, 
and seeing um, help that was needed. And I think that was just what it was. It's just putting the pieces together, like knowing so many people wanted to help and had the abilities and resources at that time in their lives to do that and seeing people that needed support and help and there was no, no bridge between the two. And so I think that's really what a big thing of what led to Indigo was just seeing that that gap in such an, it, it, on paper, an easy solution. You just connect, you know, the two. And then I studied, um, I did a postgraduate in nursing, in paediatric nursing. And the same thing happened again with, I just saw uh, a co companies came in, you can go abroad in your final year to, to nurse um, for a month. And companies came in and said, oh yeah, we can arrange this for you. But again, for so much money. And we were final year nursing students with no money. And there was seriously like over a hundred people in this lecture room wanting to volunteer um, abroad with their nursing skills and seriously I would say a handful of people went because no one could really afford it um, which is such a shame like all that untapped potential that could have been so great like uh, it would have been a two-way thing like they would have been giving their skills and also learning a lot um, and and that just wasn't that didn't happen because of of there wasn't like a a fee-free bridge to do that so again I just um through a lot of research at that time it was so hard to find I managed to find a placement in Malawi took a couple of other nurses with me um had a really successful trip uh learned a lot uh actually one of the nurses I took still this is not quite a long time ago like 12 years ago she's still she's there now she goes back every year for months and months a year to nurse at the the local medical clinic there um I mean it really changes it changed her life it changed the community's life there that are now receiving her her nursing skills I mean it's absolutely incredible um what she's doing so um I could just see these gaps and I was like well why is no one doing this hang on I'm not doing it either well I should just do it then and I think that's it. Just from speaking to people, knowing they wanted to help, and there's so much good out there. There's so much kindness that that people want to give so much so often. They want, but they don't know what where to direct that energy and and how how to give uh, their time and 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 kindness. And, and there's so many people that want to receive it, and um, but don't know how to access these people. So it's really just simply putting the two together through through my experience of of yeah, speaking to people and traveling and meeting meeting lots of communities. Can you describe that feeling you had of like intensely wanting to help? You know, when you were talking about uh, different uh, tragedies that were happening throughout the world, mm. like, can you give us a, an insight into just how that, that f showed up or felt either in your psychology mm. or your body? Like, Yeah, it, it's, it's funny because it's one of the, the strongest feelings I have and I can't necessarily work out further yet like where where that's why why I have it so strongly um I haven't worked that out yet but it's it's quite overwhelming and and so for example if I walk past someone uh who's homeless um I sometimes have to stop a conversation because I can't concentrate anymore and I when I'm with my partner he knows I just say hang on I just need a minute and he knows exactly and he gives me a minute and when I'm ready to come back I almost have to grieve it's a mini grief I'm I mini grieve it for a minute or two and then I can come back again and I have to also during that grieving I'm like can I do something here can I not um uh yeah and when I'm in London particularly um where there's lots and lots of homeless people, um, that that can be really hard. Um, I, I can really struggle. I need more than a minute. Um, you know, and this extends to the thought of people being lonely, elderly people being lonely. It makes me want to cry now. Like people being in the hospital alone, people dying alone. I, I can't bear any of it. So when I think about it, I, I don't know why, but it just really affects me. I have to grieve, do a mini grief, grieving. It then can go and I can move on but until if I don't have that time I can't concentrate on anything that's going on um and I don't know where it comes from it's just you know it's it's just something I've learned how to deal with it now I've learned how to deal with it so I can function a bit better what like what do you how would you even begin to categorize that like would you just say it's like really high like um empathy like is it yeah maybe. It, is it just having an open heart in a <laughs> in a world that doesn't that maybe that isn't yeah. keeping their hearts open like what, what, what would you even think about yeah that? and I think 
Um, I, I would say probably the one of the differences, or I don't, don't know if I'm complimenting myself here, I'm not sure, but I think my empathy isn't really selective. So I think a lot of people can can think, oh, homeless, they've done it to themselves, or, oh, that's okay because they've got a different coloured skin, so I don't have as much empathy than if it was the same colour skin as what I have. You know, I see this a lot, like selective empathy. Um, and I, for better or for worse, mine isn't doesn't seem to be selective. So I feel it for anyone that I see that's suffering in any way. Um, but yeah, I, I really... I don't know what otherwise what you'd categorize it as. Yeah, maybe it's an open heart and and non-selective empathy. I don't know, but it it takes a lot of energy. <laughs> but it's also okay. Like I'm I I'm I I really would say I, I function really quite well on on the whole. Um and I think it's because I've learned how to deal with it basically. Yeah, it does uh it sounds like an intense experience having lived in London as well and and done some work with the homeless there as well. Like it it's like it's I could imagine that being almost like being zapped or shocked or, you know, yeah. some disturbance at very, very frequent mm. intervals. The the sense then when you're when you're looking at life um, with this question around community, like wh where do you where do you see this going? Like where like what I know there's this obviously with Indigo and the the care, like the taking on like respond not responsibility but i guess like the the duty of care for people you know you've mentioned a few times i didn't see anyone stopping and i stopped i didn't see this opportunity exist for indigo so i built it like what what is your attention at the moment in terms of even your just this question you say around community that's just that kind of plays through your mind uh, your mind multiple times like do you see that as you'd like structural differences like is there is there ways or projects in your mind that even go beyond um indigo and just how we actually live together or or where where does your mind go um i think for for me now it, it's really hard because now i'm a mom so i have to like really be thinking of where the balance is and i really struggle with the balance because all i want to do is help 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 and um I want to say yes to everything and it's so hard as you know to say no and to um uh you I, I just want I just want to help everyone all the time but then it comes at the price of my family and so I'm really trying to master a balance and literally like a, a few months ago I just started a little group in the area I'm living in at the moment um of uh, so we can help each other out because the, a bunch of people I was speaking to just felt lost, felt like they had, didn't have support. I was like, right, I'm going to start a group. Like one mum, she said she took her kids to school and half an hour later she was on the uh, in the hospital about to have an appendectomy and she didn't know who was going to pick up her kids. I was like, oh my God, I could have, but she didn't know to call me. She didn't think. So I had a bunch of these examples. I thought, right, I'm going to start this little community group, which is great. Uh, and it's working, re it's really sweet. Just once in a while, we'll just ask for support when needed, you know. Um, and I can't, I can't seem to help myself. Like, I'm just like, wherever I am, I'm like, right, let's create this little group or let's do this. Or, and I do need to slow down. And I, so since becoming a mum, that has really helped me to kind of take a little bit of a step back. And I'm really comfortable with that because I know when I've got more time again, when my son's going to school or whatever, and I'm, um, maybe my job quietens down one day I don't know what but at some point um the time will be right for me to go back out there again and be much more proactive than I'm being but for now the balance is is right and I, I'm more of like a support person for people that are maybe running these groups or if there's an event I went to an event last night but someone else had to put the event on rather and normally it'd be me putting this event on it's for refugees in the area uh, trying to integrate and meet locals and so on so um I went as a supporter and and uh to, to meet rather than someone that organizes it and that's the, the switch that's happened since becoming a mum and I'm very happy with that that role and very happy to support those that are are doing it but I have so many ideas it's hard to not be acting on them particularly like I said around loneliness and elderly people I mean that one shatters my heart all the time there's so many awful things happening to children all around the world like not participating in supporting all of these groups it's hard but you can't be a hundred people you can only do what you can do and 
on the whole, I'm really okay with that. Sometimes I struggle. I'm like, ah, but on the whole, it's it's fine. And I know it is what it is. You know, Holly, through the course of this conversation, whether it was the initial question or well, letting questions like, you know, is there God or what's the point of it all kind of flow through you as, as they come and go um, to the idea of, you know, what's what are we doing as a community? What are we getting right or wrong? talking about the ability to to perhaps forgive yourself to have self-awareness self-compassion stemming even from what your mother was you know not for uh, not imposing outcomes upon you more how are you feeling and hoping you guys could be happy or content as you might put it now you know acknowledging that you only have one part of of uh, a perception on anything and well of course we can get caught up in personal uh, personal relationship stuff that just to rem- remind ourselves of that not being exclusively right or wrong seeing how that leads to kind of polarization in society and just realizing that there's a there's other ways in which we can communicate there's other ways in which we can perceive things even the idea of being forgiving Mm. to others looking at their intentions as well even now with your some of your endeavors taking up different roles and supporting people um of seeing the importance of family you know even at the very start you mentioned the idea of not only the support you received but it's important for you for your child to have connections with its grandparents not for us to be doing right. everything by ourselves asking for help all of these really important and fundamental parts to what i perceive i guess would be would be a good life just as i as i tend to finish these interviews up with it is with the question of uh, what is a good life for you holly oh that was a really good summary um So what is a good life? I think probably the standard answer, which might be a bit uh, boring of a boring answer, but then that doesn't that tell you something if this is the standard answer around family, friends, kindness, love, but it, it, you know, because this gets mentioned, I'm sure many times, it's so good to, to, recalibrate and bring yourself back to it sometimes because we can all slip off this track can't we so I would say a good life is is appreciating these simple things um being present and being kind and if you slip up which we all do all the time forgiving yourself and trying again to to be kind to be helpful to be a good community member whatever that community member means to you maybe it's a group maybe it's your family maybe it's something at at work um yeah I would say a a good life is is appreciating these these things these smaller things and um and good food (laughs) where possible (laughs) yeah Look, Holly, I'm, I'm, I really enjoyed the conversation uh, so much of um, not even just how you approach life uh, in terms of fulfilling roles or needs of other people. I find that really inspiring, but so many other interesting perspectives that you shared as well. I'm very grateful for your time here on the What is a Good Life podcast uh, this week. So thank you very much for joining us. I have really enjoyed this. Thank you so much.